Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Hope we don't get throttled. Um, continuing from that discussion of global cities, where are we? My method, Socratic, is um, bring the camera in close up, back it out for a long shot. Bring it in close up, back it up. Um, these series of lectures were backing the camera out, taking a look at the global cities. Um, do the modernist international um, individuals make the city? Does the dyad make the city? Whether that's two people, gay, straight, LGBT, whatever, finding the dyadic relationship within the city. Um, uh, certainly the cisgender dyad is something that self-replicates. We're up to 8 billion people. We, sorry, I'm moving around. Um, we see the effect of the cisgender uh, sort of narratives of Levittown. You come back from surviving Normandy, you get the GI Bill to go to college, you get um, the affordable Levittown house, the obedient uh, uh, first wave feminist wife from Simone de Beauvoir and Betty Friedan was on the cusp of that, uh, uh, Smith graduate. Um, where I used to teach, um, we have um, we have all sorts of th you know manipulations. Uh, you you're supposed to get a car in your garage. Two point five obedient children who would eventually become hippies and countercultural people when they're usually when blacks and whites and Hispanics and Asians were sent off to Vietnam to fight um, a democratic war of one. Um, uh, uh, enfeebled nation fighting off communism. Ooh, pedagogy. Still, these battles of modernity. These were battles of modernity. The concept, the ideology. But for the Vietnamese, the Vietnamese, they worked itself out practically. Um, did they want to continue a legacy of colonialism from the French to the Americans? No, they did not. The Americans were on the cusp of giving them independence. Um, Ho Chi Minh came and talked to um, Roosevelt, uh, admiring the, the revolutionary leaders of America. This mo Read modernity into this. The modernism behind Marxist, Leninist, communism is modernist, but it also morphs into the East Asian, South Asian idea of an Russian idea of communality. We talked in the last lecture about letting the uh, landscape of, of um, uh, Levittown work for you, opening up the fences, planting orchards, having gardens together, having your front yard work, having all vertical surfaces um, exposed to light, uh, developing you know, uh, food within the area. We now have the genetic engineering to make high intensive crops. The verdict is somewhat out on GMOs. Um, to what extent we're on the cusp of genetically th engineering through CRISPR, even and especially individuals. So this will be a post-modernist, post-humanist talk. So what is the post-humanist city? Um, going through the city planning, um, let's stop defining a city. Um, is it an object? Is it an anthill? Is it an invention? The internet is an inven invention. Is it the sibling to the city? That's the big question I posed um, in the sibling relationship of the city as a 6,000-year-old invention. One of enjoyable um, reading I did this morning on uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Smith's book is the notion of the middle class <laughs> in ancient cities. Go figure. We think that these uh, this was a recent invention through the industrial era, the invention of the mercantile uh, merchant classes, then into the managers of factories between BOP, bottom of pyramid, and the top parasitic classes. Um, but um, what uh, she says, Mark Lichty, anthropologist, anthropologist, suggests that um, 
The middle class throughout history has been an, um, a, a strata involved in the conditions of possibility. I love this definition. That the scribes, the jewelry makers, the in-urban craftspeople, the um, accountants, the foremen, um, entered into this so-called ancient middle class structure for its conditions of possibility and that was done in cities. Uh, now many of you go to college hoping to enter into conditions of possibility by studying your STEM subjects and getting a high GPA and getting out and bean counting. Um, these people were simultaneously sellers of labor and owners of capital with such skills as education, achievements, uh, tallying, bean counting, so forth. Um, in ancient Ur and Mesopotamia, there were hundreds of thousands of sheep that had to be um, categorized outside the city, brought in for harvest, turned into either wool or leather or mutton. Um, these sort of amazing actuarial skills happened way back in uh, 6,000 years, the, the, the creation of the city. Egypt is famous for tallying every bale of, um, I believe it is wheat or cotton or wool or something to that effect. Um, very, very, very astute actuarial society. Um, he mentions the code of Humrabi, I think I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, Hammurabi, um, and as the, the foundation for law, basically copies of the code were made thousands of years ago for a middle class reception. If there was some infraction done between the classes, it could be compensated by capital, money. Um, this is an interesting development. Want to disabuse people of the notion that a middle class happened only at the advent of modernity. Adams, we talked about Rousseau, Kant, Adam Smith as kind of the uh, French, German, English versions of actualizing your full potential as an urban individual. And let's go back to cities. Defining a city, okay, we defined it. Diverse place, full of potentials, conditions of possibility for the middle class. Unlike farmers, unlike hunter-gatherers, unlike pirate classes, even the Apache Indians of North America were known as kind of a pirate class of, of tribe that essentially preyed on the other agrarian uh, Native American, excuse me, Native Americans. Origin cities were a coagulation of not just impulses such as diversifying gene pool, but perhaps um, places conducive to this, as, as uh, Monica Smith calls it, the mojo of the middle class, where and how and what and, and to what for these type classes of people existed. Urbanism, orthodox city planning, let's call it an ant heap, it plans itself. City plan, planning a la Jane Jacobs. Vancouverism, you Canadians, you're always trying that thing. Um, uh, Jane Jacobs says that uh, the organic city, the city um, conducive to citizens in their network, watching children, watching business, are far better. But basically, culture, as Jerry said yesterday, cultural capital outstrips um, bureaucratic uh, control, command and control systems, certainly outstrips um, the market as far as guiding a city. In the beginning, uh, the medieval city was about this seamless interplay, maybe seamless, maybe not, interplay between the individual and collectivism. Um, as Jerry mentioned, uh, if the sorry, if the city needs to collectivize, this is through food only, the caloric value it takes from bringing. 10 calories of petroleum in for one calorie of food. After COVID, we see that as a dynamic indice of, of the city. Pre-industrial city, center of commerce, government knowledge, city size limited by technology, really? Um, yes, uh, plumbing. 
to put it most in its most mundane. So it took craftspeople, took scientists, took engineers to place um, the um, the piping. Um, I've seen the piping in buildings in Pompeii, lead pipes, uh, with uh, sort of substantiating that theory that the Roman emperors went crazy because of the the metal ingestion from their fresh fresh water in pipes to the um, the Palatine Hill. Um, Pompeii have seen it, old lead pipes. Um, uh, it is the technology. World's largest city in the 19th century was London. One million cities, uh, one million people. But strangely, uh, Rome, Angkor Wat, uh, I think ancient Mexico City, a couple others, uh, certainly a couple cities in China hit that mark way before that. Industrial Revolution, read modernity, Rousseau, Kant, Adam Smith, very indicative of their cultures. The, um, the French in the sense of living as entitlement, the Germans in the sense of living as idealism, and the Anglo, Anglo-American thing, living in terms of individualism, industry, leading to the, the cowboy culture, the lone cowboy culture on the tabula rasa of North America. We spoke with Jerry, a Yankee living in Australia, still that Anglo ethos of the individual protecting strong faces make strong fences make strong neighbors from Robert Frost. Perhaps it's the time for fences to come down. Um, Million Flaxus City, uh, due to the, the sort of abuses of um, land ownership in England caused this at the same time Adam Smith um, uh, Wedgware um, uh, uh, the um, the ceramics works in um, England steam engines, steam pumps in mines at the same time the French were making amazing steam powered toys for the royalty the English were making steam pumps to pump out mines um, uh, 200 years ago, kind of a different cultural European approach to things. Uh, inspiration for and from Charles Dick and Karl Marx that these cities are untenable. 12 to 16 hour work days. Who of you in your post industrial culture doesn't work more than 12 to 16 hours? I work more than that. So we're talking about Child labor laws, beating dangerous condition, measly pay, um, general abuse, to the cell phone in your pocket telling you, oh, no, no, get back to work. Oh, there's an email you got to catch at 12 midnight because it's crucial. Um, so has wage slavery, chattel slavery even changed? We have technology to kind of indicate it hasn't, but there we go. Scenes of London, slum life. Problems include overcrowding, disease, filth, crime. Um, these were, we see this in combination with um, the slab plans of Le Corbusier uh, providing 70, 80% parkland around these large slabs. Is that living compared to this? We talked about what Charles Jenks said, the advent of postmodernity coming in the form of the dynamiting of uh, the demolition of Pruitt Igo housing complex, which was ostensibly a fight against the Jim Crow laws of separate but equal of blacks and whites, former, um, former slaves, um, uh, agricultural um, African Americans in the South, as opposed to moving to the industrial north where are we going to put them we're going to put them in these slabs these slabs don't work for various reasons destroy them um jenks said this was the end of the project of modernity the end of the projects of rousseau kant and adam smith as basically false um uh, at about that time we saw the collapse of the berlin wall and state socialism as an enforced project of modernity. Um, just interesting, wh wherever you set in your belief systems, we have facts for both. Um, interesting, here's where people lived. 
uh, London, 1901. Uh, typhoid, yellow fever, cholera, total collapse in life chances. So we see the BOP, bottom of the pyramid, in a struggle against the middle class, uh, um, the context of possibilities within cities for 6,000 years as scribes, knowledge people. Now we see this um, from the Monica Smith book. Now we see this transforming into the post-human gig economy culture of the always on worker and we talked about what is the optimal workspace after covid going further hope we don't get throttled um history repeats itself first is tragedy second is farts did it repeat itself with sorry with the middle class um one of the contentions is that the middle class, the so-called actuarial, bureaucratic, um, so-called literate class, has that really existed, as we see from Babylonian sources, for six, five thousand years? Um, is it repeating itself as a farce, the, the middle class farce, the factory owners finally challenging the royalty um, wealth by birth um, uh, uh, parasites that the French and then later the Germans, certainly the Americans, um, entirely disagreed with. Um, why there's still an English royal family with its spectacle, anyone's mystery. Um, orthodox, density is bad, streets are wasteful, read slabs. Chaotic accidents, summation of the haphazard, read slabs. Um, a foreground of noise, dirt, beggars, reed slabs, Corbusian slabs. Uh, Garden City tried to take this and turn this back into an art project. Um, if they had not been alienated from the product products of their labors, they would be happier. Um, hmm. uh, traveled to America, said, wow, these people are dealing with this tabula rasa. They're kind of involved in handiwork, very inventive society. Even Tocqueville said this of, of his study of uh, democracy in America. Who are the Americans? What, what, what makes them go? What makes them tick? The, the response from transcendentalism that I pointed out shows up in the movie Nomadland, kind of a, a cool end quote to this project of modernity. The, the, is it the emptiness of the cowboy individuality, the possibility of the middle class, the, 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 the sort of 6,000 year development of, of the context of possibility created in the middle class, or as an older woman, is she a castaway? Um, there's a great account of these in most civilizations. The Satyricon by Petronius is, is a great example from 2,000 years before the movie Nomadland. So we see um, the, no, the Okies of the Depression. We see this idea of, okay, given that we have no longer have opportunities, do we become these kind of postmodern, post-human nomads again? living in our vans, working in seasonal labor in Amazon. I asked you to watch that film, Nomadland. Not a tremendous film, but a tremendously subtle film. Incredibly subtle film. Um, on many levels. A, 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 a feminine, female level, a sense of, of stasis movement, arrival, departure, completion of narratives, post-industrial. Tremendous film. And above all, I contend, a wedding between the American idea of transcendentalism, a very spiritual movement, which we see the Francis, Francis McDormand character going through, and Chinese Taoism from the Chinese director. I see both these strains sort of giving kind of a uplifting, um, elevated sort of attitude toward the end of the film, even though it's she makes her choices, she chooses not 
to make the final dyad with the man who has interest in her. There's no violence. I was totally expecting some violent action. Unlike Hollywood, there was no climax in violence and an epiphany through violence. It was um, an amazing, subtle film. So Ebenezer Howard returned back to the uh, Arts and Craft Garden Cities, which we're trying to look at. And Jerry mentioned, it, like, what if we open up the Levittown ideal and make every surface, surface including the vertical surface, agricultural? Um, we are on the edge. Um, I gave a speech uh, or talk at post-human conference at NYU talked about this collision of three things. Post-peak oil, um, the rise of the AI deciding for us, and the rise of CRISPR bioengineering at a cut rate value. Um, this movie I saw on Netflix had these redneck guys in their sheds in the back in Alabama like engineering new forms of life. Uh, it's an amazing time. Uh, we're right on the cusp of many, many, many different tipping points. Um, it ain't dull. Um, uh, North at First Plan City, uh, in that Garden City way. Corbu, slab guy. Um, make him shut up and put him in slabs. Um, great thought behind that. And I've lived in slab places in Seoul. I personally liked it. Um, small room, uh, what was it, 20 by 20. Had uh, one of the ex-wives there with me. Um, she demanded more space. But um, it was interesting and it was nice because the whole community where I lived in Taihano in Seoul became my backyard. Uh, I could go out to the Colby shops, I could eat out with friends, I could see the activities. Um, I did not mind living in a slab, um, high density slab, uh, with the provision that it was interesting around me. Um, the Seoul is an interesting city in that it has these large, kind of almost mountains in the middle of the city. You could go up, if you, if you took the effort, you could go up the mountain and be alone. Very incredible geography in these cities. Uh, Corbu, Corbu and the Radiant City influenced Garden City, but more right angles. Um, even though his paintings and his Enchamp and a couple other projects are very curvilinear, very curvilinear, very complex individual. Uh, uh, you like him or hate him or like some of his stuff and hate some of his stuff. Um, very elitist too, Swiss elitist. Oh, okay, got a problem with the urban poor, put him in this hamster hut. Um, tendency of people don't like hamster huts culturally, um, especially if it is in response to Jim Crow laws of separate to equal. It's just, no, no. Um, we want what they're having. Um, the, the Levittown, Cape Cod, front yard, backyard, whatever. Um, uh, I, again, I lived in these kind of slabs in East Asia, enjoyed them immensely. You know, what are the 20, 20 stories down to the street level? Um, look out at the mountain. I loved it. Anyway. <coughs> Vertical Garden City, slabs again. Um... Suppose we're entering the city the way of Great Park, going through a park to enter a city. Our first car takes a special elevated motor track. That, okay, he had airplanes landing on it. Good luck on that. I'm waiting for my jetpack. Um, all of that good stuff. Slabs. This is, I think, Brasilia. In the middle of the jungle. Open tabula rasa land of, without native uh, South Americans. In the middle of Brazil. So these were slabs that were meant to be ordered, logical. All these other ideals, more the ideals of Immanuel Kant, perhaps the three strains, Rousseau, Kant, uh, Adam Smith, Kantian. Um, everyone should get this equally. Everyone's an individual. Everyone's an end in itself. Take this. We should provide. Very paternalistic. We should provide. What we know, Radiant City can work well in affluent neighborhoods, I lived in affluent neighborhoods in Asia, and uh, I would look down at a poor guy like doing laundry at uh, in a laundry 
um, service at four in the morning, just repetitive motions, and it was like, I'm glad I'm up here. Um, interesting. It's a disa disastrous in poor neighborhoods. We see poor, we see rich, kind of this utopian ordered plan, uh, like Logan's Run, uh, where everyone lives to 30 and then they're terminated. Um, interesting, sort of egalitarian, totalitarian, Epicurean ideals, as in some of these sci fi. Most Radiant City developments were built for low income s persons. That's the rub. Stuyvesant now is a little upper class, but still ugly. Ugly. Um, nice parks. Jane Jacobs, uh, Jane Jacobs countered this, said, Hey, why doesn't everyone live in uh, West Village and look after the kids? Yeah. Neighborhood patrols will serve the function of policemen and so forth. Yeah, and then the joke is, um, in the aughts, when, after she died or she moved to Toronto, how much she actually sold her West Village apartment for was a couple million. Who can afford that, Jane? Um, so things change. Things gentrify. Do slabs gentrify? Yes, they do, depending on where they're at. In the middle of Seoul, middle of Tokyo, middle of New York, middle of Moscow, um, there are amenities for slabs, um, bourgeois, middle-class amenities for slabs, such as gyms, um, saunas, services. We find these in the new Chinese cities. Um, I found this in Songdo, as I taught in Songdo, the f one of the first smart cities where everything's interlinked with the algorithms of city development, and it's outside of Seoul, meant to be a satellite city, but the, the, again, the gender influence men would take the two hour commute into Seoul and come back um, very much like Levittown, uh, but it, with a twist in slabs and not in um, Cape Cods. Um, she loves sidewalks, hates parks, because that's Corbu. Radiant City, Garden Beautiful, or what Jane Jacobs hates about urban planning. It's an attack on current urban planning we're building. It is also in a mostly attempt to introduce new principles. She had a lot going for her. Back to this kind of like a gentrified view of the slums, old non-dense living. But as we know from the lesson of New York, those became gentrified. Those are more conducive to gentrify. Over here in um, Bed-Stuy, a former very ferocious ghetto of disadvantaged people, they're now very expensive houses. Old brownstones that were formed by the trolley system coming out of New York. Um, duh. Bound to happen, right? Gentrification. Um, a healthy city. What we want to achieve? Mixed primary uses, diversity, sensible. But now, does that diversity thing work? Sense of belonging? Okay, if you're a financer going in to Wall Street during the day and coming back to your your spouse, gay, straight, or otherwise, um, what has developed out of your narrative of spatial use according to your identity, or you make the identity fit your spatial use? Um, uh, Jacobs, yes, interesting person, death and life of, of great American cities. Here is the White Horse Tavern, which I filmed in um, in another project this past December. It was almost going to shut down, or is this the city arms near the White Horse? Okay, there we go. On Hudson Street, safety, green spaces, um, can work or not. There's, you know, um, Chapter 5, Problem with Projects. Projects turn inward into courtyards away from streets and sidewalk. Is this a bad thing? Um, maybe this is a cultural approximation. The individualist West would say, nah. Um, maybe East Asia, South Asia would say, this is the way we've lived for thousands of years. What's the difference? Um, interesting, flying into Seoul for one of the first times, flying into Tokyo, it seemed like a gigantic medieval city with a rim of these 30-story walled cities, walls right around the city, Seoul, maybe the second largest 
city on Earth, uh, debatable. Um, Tokyo still holds that central position because everyone who's talented heads into the urban center. Read the middle class, as we're talking about the middle class. Um, certainly the agrarian and the, the other areas of China have emptied out for this diversity. We will, then we get to SimCity, um, simulating the algorithms. But we're at 30, 30 minute mark and we shall cut. Um, see you next lecture.